morning and welcome to the online service of Lifeway Baptist Church. We're delighted that you are joining us today as we worship the Lord together. I want to remind you that tonight at 6 o'clock, we will meet together in person here in this auditorium. We did that last Sunday. We'll do that again tonight and then, Lord willing, next Sunday night. On June the 14th, we are looking forward to our first time back together in a morning service at 10 a.m. in a long time. I hope that you'll be able to make plans to join us. Today, we are going to hear from Pastor Doug Stewart. He's going to open the Word of God and take us to Ephesians 4 in just a little bit. I'm looking forward to hearing this message entitled, Maintaining Unity of the Spirit. As we consider that topic, it's essential that we understand that unity is possible within the body of Christ because of Christ, because of the Lord Jesus. I'd like to read this morning from Revelation chapter 7, and I'd like to read verses 9 and 10 as we begin our time together. Listen to what it says. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. What a day that will be, one day when all believers will gather together of every tribe, of every group of people, of every color, of every nationality, to sing praise unto our God and to worship Him in perfect harmony forever and ever. Today, we have the opportunity to worship together in unity as the body of Christ. Our hearts grieve this morning because of the disunity that we see in our world, specifically in a world without Jesus Christ. As we begin this morning, I want to I want to encourage you to pray with me as we unite our hearts in prayer to pray for the disunity that's in our country and specifically to pray for wisdom, to pray for justice, and to pray for healing. Let's begin with prayer. Our Father, we come to you this morning grateful that you have given us this day to worship you. Our hearts need to be directed towards your truth, your word. Your word, your truth is what sets us free. As we prepare to sing of your goodness and hear from your word today, we acknowledge in our own hearts a tendency to to judge others and to see ourselves as better than others. Lord, forgive us of our sin of pride. Lord, we ask you that you would comfort the suffering and give wisdom to our leadership today. We long for your kingdom. We pray, Lord, especially for people in Minnesota today and for the the difficult suffering that's taking place there. We pray that of all things that take place, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ would be taught and preached and heard and accepted today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning. Thank you for gathering to worship with us today. We have a great God who is worthy of our lives. He is powerful. He is creator. He is the one in control. As we sing this morning, we're going to have some songs and hymns focused on worshiping our great God. Our first hymn, Be Thou Exalted, focuses on who he is. It lists out so many names and attributes of God that make him worthy of our exaltation. And then we're moving on to our second hymn, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. You probably know this hymn and I encourage you as you sing it to consider the holiness, the absolute perfection. He is completely separate from any of our failings. He is a holy, set-apart God. He is worthy of our worship because of his holiness. Then Lori Wood is going to play a medley, a worship medley, 
And as we come out of that, we're going to sing together, O church, arise. This great God who is worthy of my worship, who is worthy of my life, has called his church, has called us to spread the name of Christ to every nation and every person. O church, arise reminds us of that call. And then we'll finish before the message with the song, Speak, O Lord. God's word communicates to us. It changes us. And so this morning, we'll finish with a prayer that our holy God will speak to us through his divinely inspired word. And I pray that this morning, you will be changed as we worship together.
Good morning. If you could take your Bible now and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to be looking at the first few verses of Ephesians 4. And as you're doing that, I would encourage you to take a look at our new worship guide that we would like to use over the next few weeks and months. And we might end up using it forever. I don't know. What we want to do with this is help people spend time in God's Word, not only on Sunday morning when we sit here and open God's Word, but through the rest of the week. How does that tie into what we're doing Sunday night? How does that tie into what I'm reading day by day through the week? How do I remember the applications and the responses I should have to what I heard Sunday morning? This is gonna put that all together. You can get this through the email you received from the church. You can also go to the church website. Now there's two versions. One version is a printer-friendly version that puts two half sheets of paper together on one sheet so you could print it out very easily. The other version is made for someone who wants to use their phone. So if you would like to pull your phone up and use this worship guide with your phone, you can do that now by going to the church website. You can also do that as you go throughout your week. Maybe you want to remember the text that we spent so much time in this morning. Maybe you want to pray with your children and pray specific things about what we've learned from God's word this morning. You can use this worship guide to do that. I would encourage you to do that. Well, here we are in Ephesians chapter four. Let me read the first three verses and we'll pray and begin. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 reads, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Let's pray. Dear God, as we come to your word this morning, It is our desire that we would be changed. We don't come to your word perfect. We come imperfect, in need of adjustment and change, in need of repentance, in need of praising you for who you are. So I pray that as we receive the food of your word this morning, that we would be changed and that our church would grow because of it. In Jesus' name, Amen. Well, just about two months ago, we stopped meeting together in person. And here we are now, a little bit more than two months later, and we're beginning to gather together again. I think it's important for us to remember that we need to pursue Christian unity now more than ever before. The landscape of 2020 is one that none of us would have ever expected. And this landscape is full of minefields and pits that we could fall into. And we don't want that to happen. As individual believers and as a church, we want to grow through this season that God has given to us. And so that means that we have to have a strong biblical foundation of what God has done and what he is doing and then what our response should be because of it. As we think about Christian maturity, that's a good context for us as we consider the book of Ephesians. Some epistles in the New Testament have specific themes and are written because of specific problems that churches were facing. Take, for instance, the book of 1 Peter. It's a letter that was scattered to believers who were being persecuted and who were suffering. Then you have a book like 1 Corinthians that was written to a specific church, a church at Corinth, and it was to help them because they were divided among themselves. And they had many sin issues, one of which was sexual immorality that Paul needed to specifically address. But here we are in the book of Ephesians. There's no specific problem that's mentioned. We're just talking about growth, Christian maturity, and what it means to be united in Christ. In fact, that's one of our main themes in the book of Ephesians, is being united to Christ. Now, if we were to look at the book of Ephesians and try and make the simplest outline possible, we would divide the book into two points. The first point would be from chapters 1 through 3, and that's what God 
has already done for us. What God has already done for us. That's a good thing for us to remember because so often we are prone to approach God believing that if we just could do a little bit more, then he would do a little bit more for us. But no, instead, God has done everything for us through Christ. And then we come to chapter 4, 5, and 6, and we see what our response should be to what God has already done. I mentioned that one of the main themes in the book of Ephesians is our union with Christ. Let's look at that for just a second. Turn maybe a page back to Ephesians chapter 2, and let's read verse 10. It tells us that we are his workmanship. As we've trusted in the gospel and we're Christians, it tells us that we're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. That means that we are In Christ, if you were to stop and count the number of times Paul uses the phrase in Christ or even in him in the book of Ephesians, you would just be shocked. Other epistles talk about our union with Christ, but specifically Ephesians makes it clear that we are in Christ. Now, what does it mean to be in Christ? That's easy for us to read. We just read it there in Ephesians 2.10, but What does it mean that we are in Christ? Well, when we come to Christ and we know him as Savior, we're saved. That's what we generally say. But we could also say that when we trusted Christ as our personal Savior, we were placed into Christ. We were united to Christ. As you work through the book of Ephesians, you see the glorious grace of God through the gospel that reconciles sinners to God. We're brought into a close relationship when we were afar off. We're now fellow citizens with each other, and we're now in Christ. But as we work through the book of Ephesians, we also see that the church that God has created is full of a variety of people. We have Jews and Gentiles, who are one now because of their union with Christ. We could say that union just has to do with us as enemies, once far off, now brought near by the blood of Christ. That's included. But union with Christ is more than that. We could say it this way because it's not an easy thing to consider or to just describe very concisely, but I think this is the best way for us to describe it. Union with Christ means that every blessing of redemption and salvation belongs to us. We're not going down this pathway receiving more and more blessings and grace from God as we do better and become a better Christian. No, in fact, Ephesians tells us that God has blessed us completely. Let me show you this in Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians chapter 2, we see verses 4, 5, 6, and 7. And these are familiar verses, but I want you to consider these verses with the context of being in Christ. Verse 4 says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is crucial that we understand that God has blessed us before we deserved to be blessed. It's important for our Christian maturity because it's natural for us to believe that I have to do something for then God to turn around and bless me but we actually find that the gospel is so radically different than what we think, we see something completely different. Look now at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. The very beginning of the book, we're going to see what God has to tell us about his blessing and his grace in our life. He says in verse 3 of chapter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessing." in heavenly places, in Christ. Did you note that? He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings when we are 
in Christ. So if you are a believer, if you are in Christ, if you are united to Christ, you have received all spiritual blessings. God's not withholding things from you, hoping that you just do better and then he would give more good things to you. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ. And then it tells us why he does that. That's a logical question. God, why would you do that? He says in verse 6, he has done this to or for the praise of his glory, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. And then in verses 7 and 8, he just continues and tells us more about this grace that he's given to us. He says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now, based on what? He's going to explain it as we continue reading. According to the riches of his grace, the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us. And the image is that God has taken his grace and just poured it out on us and didn't pour a little bit and make sure it was okay and then poured more and stopped and waited to see if it was okay. Kind of like the way my kids pour their lemonade or their milk when it's a big jug. He's just taken his grace and poured it on us, all of it. And he's done that for the praise of his glory. Now, when we get to the second part of Ephesians, the second part of our outline, we start in chapter 4, we see the response. That's what God has done, Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, and it builds to chapter 4, where he says, now, here's how you are to respond to the grace that you have received. Let's look at verse 1 of chapter 4. Paul says, I, therefore, because of what God has done, Because of what God has given me through Christ by his grace, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with longsuffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. It would be completely ridiculous if our outline of Ephesians was switched. If we began the book of Ephesians by God saying, you need to endeavor or work to maintain unity amongst yourselves so that you could be united to Christ, that would be absolutely ridiculous. No, the opposite is true. Because you have been blessed, because you've received God's grace, because you are united to Christ, now we pursue Christian unity. The idea is that of what's vertical and horizontal. Maybe you've heard that before. We don't work on what's horizontal to receive from God what's vertical. God gives us what he gives us so that we can extend that to those around us. The same thing would be true for forgiveness. If God has forgiven me, I should forgive those around me. If I'm not willing to forgive those around me, why should I understand that I'm forgiven by God? And so we know that God gives us his grace to radically transform our lives. Now, as it deals with Christian unity, because this is true in all areas of the Christian life, but specifically now today with Christian unity, we understand that we are to strive for unity because God has united us into one body through Christ. We see that in verses 4 through 6. Let's look at them again and see the logic that he's giving us. He says, there is one body. Let's just stop and think about this. There is one gathering of people who is a body of believers. Now that happens in different places all around the world, but as we think about our lives and coming together with God's people, that's usually in the context of coming to a place which we're starting to do now, assembling again. And we're coming together and we're desiring to be united together. As we think about that, there's one body and it's based on the fact that there is one spirit. So the logic goes this way. If there were two spirits, then there would be two bodies. 
and those bodies would be separate and distinct. But there's not two spirits. There's one spirit who indwells believers and unites them together with Christ. The same thing continues, even as you're called in one hope of your calling. There are not two gospels. Galatians makes that clear. But if there were to be two gospels that pointed us to two promises that we were to hope in, then that would create two bodies. But there are not two bodies. There is one body with one gospel with one hope. It continues through. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. It's quite clear that God has united us to Christ to unite us to each other. God did not unite us to Christ to make an us and a them. That's important for us to consider because often we tend to live our lives with that kind of a perspective. There's the us and then there's the them. No, Ephesians tells us that because we're united to Christ, we are now one body and we are to strive to maintain unity of the spirit. There are so many opportunities for us in the landscape of 2020. There there always is, but specifically now, in the landscape of 2020, there are so many opportunities for us to fall into the pit of believing that there's an us and a them. Let me just walk through several of these things that we might hear. Well, you might have people say, we should assemble together. And then some people say, we shouldn't assemble together. Some might say, we should all wear masks. Some might say, uh, we, we shouldn't wear masks. Some might say, we should sing. Some might say, we should not sing. Some might say that sitting apart from one another is foolish, but others might say that doing the opposite is foolish. Every one of us has considered these things as we think about gathering together again. So I don't say them to create division. I say them because we need to recognize that if we're not careful, and if we don't come to the Lord dependent on his grace, we would by nature tend to have these attitudes towards one another. Every one of us has an opinion on all of these things. Every one of us do. And so we need to remember that the church does not define itself by simply having the same opinions. And it's a shame there are many churches who fabricate their own man-made kind of unity by forming together their opinions and then pulling people in who have the same kinds of opinions. I do not believe that brings glory to God or shows the grace of God to anyone. The grace of God is shown by Christ uniting different individual believers to himself and then because of that, having those believers unite together. Not because they have the same opinion, but because they're all united to Christ. This means that while the world is tearing itself apart because everybody has an opinion. You know that. I'm just stating the obvious. While the world is tearing itself apart, the church, God's people, should be modeling a Christ-like sacrificial love. I would encourage you to pray for our church, to pray for Lifeway. I have not heard anything that would lead me to believe or cause me to believe that there is any kind of disunity within our body. What I'm saying, though, is that there's potential pitfalls for our church to fall into. We don't want to do that. We want to bring glory to God. We want to be united to one another. So pray for Lifeway. But then I would also encourage you to spend time this week in praying for other gospel-preaching churches, not just here in Ellettsville or Bloomington or Indiana or even the United States. This is a global pandemic. There are churches everywhere who will be or maybe are struggling with these very things, not understanding that their unity is based on their union with Christ. And they find themselves dividing and struggling and fighting and frustrated. That doesn't bring honor to Christ. 
It doesn't reveal the riches and glory of Christ to the world. So there's three points I'd like for us to consider. Number one, though God has united us, we can work against unity. Look at verse three with me. He says, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit. Endeavoring to keep. We need to to work at that. We need to fight for that. If we don't, then we work against unity. It's common for us. We want everyone else to do the same thing that we do. Um, And it's common for us to work against unity. You've seen this before if you've watched children play. You have Sally who wants to build a unicorn princess ice cream truck out of Legos. And you have Jimmy who wants to build a bone crushing tank. And whenever they play together with the same Legos, they each have their own desire. They each have their own opinion. I don't know why it is with building. But if you've ever watched kids build things, everybody wants to do something different. And you can watch World War III occur right before your eyes. The same thing can happen within the church. If we want everyone else to think the way we think, we will work against unity. And this doesn't just apply to COVID-19 and where we are in reopening our churches. This applies to every area of life. But specifically for us right now, It does apply to how we reopen our public gatherings. If we are more concerned with temporal things than eternal things, we will work against unity. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be concerned with temporal things. We should, with wisdom and discretion, be informed in the decisions that we make. We need to do that. What I'm saying is that at the end of the day, the thoughts that I have toward you and the thoughts that you have toward me shouldn't be consumed by what news station we watch. What should consume my thoughts about you is that Christ has bought you with his blood and vice versa. Therefore, based on that fact alone, it is my joy to be around you. Not because you have the same opinion that I have, but because Christ bought you. And he bought me. And we're both in Christ. And therefore, we are to work and strive to maintain that unity. The second point to consider. Though God has united us, we don't naturally work towards unity. Look at verse 1. He says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, I beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Now, let me try and smooth that out so that the richness of God's word hits us with full force. What he's saying is this, I urge you, I'm pleading with you, I urge you to live in such a way that fits with the grace that God has already piled up and poured down on you. I'm urging you to live in that way. Unity doesn't just happen. And there is a massive pitfall for us in realizing this. We're beginning to gather again now. And maybe you have missed gathering together. I have. Many of you are thinking, I've just been waiting to get back together again. But we have to make sure we don't fall into the pit that thinking just because we're now in the same room, we're now practicing Christian unity. Assembling together does not guarantee unity. And it could be easy for us to believe that that's the case. We need to, as believers and as a church, We need to seriously consider how we each will participate in maintaining Christian unity. It's true. COVID-19 is evil. It is bad. It's, I believe Satan is using it to try to dampen the spread of the gospel and to try and hinder Christian growth and maturity and destroy Christian unity. I think that's one of his main objectives. But we have to remember that God is sovereign over that. He is providentially working over that to accomplish his purposes. And he's working, and he has been working, to bring us to the point that we are at today so that we can grow in Christian unity like we never have before. I believe that with all of my heart. 
Do we have that same perspective? Do we know that that's what God is doing, working to bring his believers closer to one another? Let me ask you a difficult question. It's actually a difficult question for me, and I'll give you my response in a second. But let me ask you this question. Are you prepared, are you more prepared to pursue Christian unity now than you were two months ago? Are you more prepared now to pursue Christian unity than you were two months ago? I'll be honest, when I asked myself that question, I sat and I looked up at the ceiling and I thought, I'm not sure if I know how to answer that question. And most likely you're probably in the same situation that I was in. So let's go to our third point and see and evaluate our hearts to see if we are prepared to pursue Christian unity. Point three under points to consider. Because God has united us, we strive to be united. So again, how do I know if I'm ready to pursue Christian unity? Let me just read Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 as you think about that question. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, Beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, with all lowliness and meekness and long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The core of Christ like Christian unity is one of self sacrifice. Having the mind of Christ. Being Christ-like. We see that in verse 2. Unity can't exist when it's my way or the highway. Nor can unity exist when I have a stronger desire to receive from people than I have as a desire to serve and give to people. It's easy for us to walk into a group of people and have desires to receive things. And People have thought that way for many, many years, for centuries. Ever since the beginning of the church, people have used the church as an opportunity to get something. It could be accolades, it could be um, comfort, it could even be encouragement, which the church does encourage one another. But if I'm walking into the church just believing I should be receiving something, I'm missing something. Because I am in Christ. I assemble together with other believers so that I could be like Christ to those other believers and give of myself. That doesn't mean that you sit down in a pew and somebody across the pew says, man, it's been a long day, I'm really hungry, and you walk over with a towel over your arm and say, how can I serve you? Can I take your order? I'm not talking about that kind of serving and that kind of giving. What this means, and I'm going to be cautious here because these are going to be difficult for us to swallow. They're going to be difficult for us to, to hear and to think through. But I'm in a room by myself, so nobody can boo me or throw anything at me. What it means to be self-sacrificial towards one another means things like this. We keep our opinions to ourselves. That doesn't mean that we can't have opinions and talk about our opinions, but it means that we don't allow our opinions to govern our relationships with other people. It means that we allow other people to have differing opinions than us. That's going to be the case. That always is going to be the case. But especially now, that's going to happen. And that's okay. Christian unity isn't dependent on other people viewing 2020 and COVID-19 the same way as me. It just isn't. And we have to remember that. It means that I don't get offended if someone else tells me I should wear a mask when I'm talking with them. Self-sacrificial love says, how can I serve you? How can I give to you? If that's what you would prefer, I will do it. It's difficult for us and it's hard for me because probably much like you, I am an American And I believe that we should preserve our freedom and our liberty. But let me say something that might be be difficult for us. When we look at Ephesians chapter 4, the response I have to what God has given me in Christ, the response I have for other people 
compels me to first of all and mainly strive for unity, not my own personal freedom. How do those work together? I don't fully know, but I know what our text tells us, that I need to work for and toward unity. It means that it is more important that I choose to love you than to be frustrated with the fact that it seems to me like you listen to a news station that I don't agree with. That's self-sacrificial love. There are so many more examples that we could give, and I would encourage you to make a list of your own examples that you will have to deal with and face as you pursue Christian unity with Lifeway over the next few weeks and months. But if I could summarize it this way, it simply means this. It means that I have and you have. It means we have the mind of Christ. Philippians chapter 2. May the mind of Christ be in you. What does that mean? Well, look at verse 2. Who is, this is my question for you, who is the embodiment of Ephesians 4 verse 2? With all lowliness, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. That is surely Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. He is the embodiment of all of these things. And if I have the mind of Christ, I will daily stand in awe of the grace God has given me as he's placed me in Christ, and I will respond to that truth daily, regularly, by worshiping him. And the way that I do that is by preferring one another over myself. Let's pray. Dear God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is so relevant. It is always relevant, but every time we open it, it's true that it seems it's even more relevant in the situation we're in. Lord, thank you that we can pursue Christian unity. And that's not based on what people think or how people live their lives or what they listen to but it's based primarily on the fact that you have given your son as a ransom to purchase sinners unto yourself. And that because we are in Christ, we can be united with those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.